Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here in this amazing building and this amazing society. I've, I've kind of been blessed to look at all the aspects and be inside all the aspects of the chemical enterprises. And there's so many approaches to sustainability we hear about. Responsible care, safe and sustainable by design, resilient systems, thinking, limits to growth, the UN SDGs, circular economy, biomimicry, ecology of commerce, cradle to cradle, planetary boundaries and green chemicals. It's almost like there's so many different approaches. What makes me so sad right now, we're in such a polarized society. Every time someone says, oh, this is the right approach and this is the incorrect approach, or this one's better and this one's not, you know, the world is facing so many diverse problems, and we humans are such a diverse group of people. If someone wakes up in the morning and one of these approaches speaks to them, rather than explain to them why they should be doing something else, we should just kind of find a way to work better together and mutually support one another. And what that requires is us to take a step back and look at the materials economy and the materials ecology through a, through, a, through a different lens. And so the way I like to describe it, we take natural resources and through extraction we make molecules and ingredients. Then we take those molecules and ingredients and we synthesize materials and components. Then we take those materials and components and we manufacture products. And if we do a very good job, those products stay in use and reuse for a very long time. But inevitably, we have to turn those products back to materials and components through mechanical recycling, through what I call the assembly-disassembly system. Then we have to take those materials and components and revert them back to molecules and ingredients through reprocessing, what I call the materials metabolism. And then finally, we want those molecules and ingredients to degrade back to natural resources through the regeneration cycle so that we can ultimately maintain stable ecosystems. This isn't a circle, and although the, the word isn't quite accurate, I refer to this as a pendulum. All right, and what it is is if you look at the intersection down the bottom, going clockwise in this pendulum is the human built world, and going clockwise in this pendulum is the natural world. And if we look at that intersection on the bottom, it is an algorithmical assessment of sustainability. We can look at how we in the human built world are impacting the natural world and if that overlap is appropriate or not. So it would be foolhardy to be get to believe that there's no impact, but as long as being mindful of what that impact is. But sometimes we, we get caught up in separating the human built world from the natural world. We humans are organisms that are a, are a result of evolution. We are as much a part of nature as anything else. And I think sometimes that puts us in the wrong place when we start to think of ourselves as being outside of nature. That is essentially where green chemistry fits into every one of those circles, every one of those cycles is where green chemistry is the utilization of a set of principles that reduce or eliminate the use of generation of hazardous substances and the design, manufacture, application of chemical uh, products. And so the whole point here is it's not measuring, it's not remediating, it's not picking up, it's inventing the product to not have those problems in the first place. That's a singularly unique thing. And so the principles of green chemistry are not marketing bumper stickers. I don't expect people to say, hey, buy this product because it's consistent with four of the 12 principles. When I look at these principles, they speak to mechanistic chemistry. They speak to the person in the lab that he or she is pouring the beakers in the flask. We're talking about activation energy. We're talking about um, protecting groups. And it's deep, fundamental mechanistic chemistry. So one way to think about it is green chemistry is the molecular mechanisms of sustainability. But here's the problem. Imagine if tomorrow morning, every person in the world wakes up and says, you know, I'm only gonna buy sustainable products. Every retailer says, we're only gonna sell sustainable products. Every manufacturer says, we're only gonna make sustainable products. Okay, job done. Well, we got a problem. I would argue of all the products and processes in our society today, maybe 10% truly tick all the boxes. 90% is either big problem, little problem, but there's some things we gotta do better. If we look at the low-hanging fruit, the things that are existing in the supply chain that might help us, maybe there's another 10, 15%. But right now in 2023, I would argue 65, 70, maybe even 75% of the technologies haven't been 
invented yet. This isn't an epic battle of good and evil. This isn't Darth Vader and industry and environmentalist Luke Skywalker fighting some epic age-old battle. Yes, there's a little bit of that going on, but there's a certain more fundamental crisis here that it's not a crisis of desire. It's a crisis of ability. Do we have a workforce that understands how to invent technologies. Right now, you can get a PhD in chemistry at almost every global university and never have a class on how do you predict whether something is toxic. You can get a license to go invent for the world and never have any idea about the environmental mechanisms of degradation. So how can we ask people who have absolutely no training in this to solve these problems. And that's the point of green chemistry. It is that mechanistic science that adds to all the amazing other things that people do. But of course, therefore, the biggest barrier to this game is actually the invention. But the big thing that worries me right now and keeps me awake at night is we still got a long way to go. And most universities still aren't teaching how do you anticipate negative impacts on human health and the environment when you invent stuff? The definition of green chemistry. And so Dr. Amy Cannon, my wife and I, back in 2007, started a nonprofit university organization, and we asked chemistry departments at universities to sign a commitment that they will bring the principles of green chemistry into the required curriculum, not as an elective, but to change the fundamental concept of what it means to be a chemist, to be a material scientist. I'm proud to say that over 120 universities worldwide have signed this commitment. And again, Monash is the first university in the summit of Southern Hemisphere to do this. This is where change is going to happen. It's not going to happen by wishing and dreaming and hoping. We need people who have the fundamental skills. We need to teach those fundamental skills. And I'm super optimistic because it is happening. We've spent time here in Australia and Cairns and Brisbane and, and Melbourne, the next generation refuses to do it any other way. We just got to put together the willpower to give them the tools and just watch amazing happen. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. One of the things that uh, we need to recognize is that the old saying is that if you do what you always do, you're going to get what you always got. So we're facing a whole lot of uh, challenges in a world where Everything that we see, touch, and feel is a chemical. Everything is, is matter or energy. And what green chemistry is about is how you use, um, use these principles to redesign the material basis of our society and our economy in ways that even touch the materials that are used to generate, store, and transport our energy. As Einstein famously said, problems can't be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. And so if we're going to take on these great grand challenges, it's unlikely that we're going to just tweak around the edges and make things a little bit less bad. We have to take on these challenges with a new perspective. We have been miraculously good at solving problems. No doubt about it, as a species, the past 200 years or so, we have taken on some amazing problems and come up with tremendous, tremendously innovative solutions. There's only one problem. We're terribly bad at defining problems well. Getting the problem statement right has been a, uh, been a difficulty for us. So we don't want to just generate cheap energy. We want to generate energy that doesn't change the only atmosphere and climate that we have. We don't want to generate um, medicines that extend life and improve quality of life. We want to do it in ways that don't actually disperse carcinogens and other poisons into our environment. We don't want to grow more crops, we want to grow crops in ways that aren't going to make our waters and our soils toxic. I could go on and on. So we haven't fully developed our problem statement capabilities. So we have this great grand challenge. We're talking about a civilization level wide challenge, transformation, but the good news is that this, this civilization level transformation has happened before in history. This is where the organization, the structures of society actually transform. And when they transform, what accompanies this, these great transformations is a shift in thinking about certainly at least three fundamental questions. 
What is knowable and unknowable? What is possible versus impossible? And what is our role in the universe vis-a-vis -vis a, a divine being or the universe itself? I'm going to suggest that there are, even looking only at technology forces in play, that there are forces that have the ability to change the answers to these questions. And I'm going to start with big data analytics, big data synthetics. You know, it was only uh, about six years ago or so that we hit the first zettabyte of data. Do you know how many zettabytes were produced last year? As I understand it, 93. So this explosion and how we understand the, 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 the meaning of data, the flows of data in order to get um, understanding and, and make it useful is something that is um, changing the way that it informs um, what we know versus what we can't know. I'm also going to mention that this ability for us to have ubiquitous networked integrated sensors to the point where sensors are small, so small they're referred to as you know basically sensor dust. They're so small, so cheap, fractions of a penny, ubiquitous and interconnected. Again, it informs what's possible and impossible, knowable versus unknowable. 3D printing is no longer about little trinkets and gadgets and missing chess pieces and missing buttons. Now it's about a functioning, printing a functioning heart. And of course, synthetic biology. If we walk down the street of Melbourne and we ask people, is it possible to generate new forms of life? The vast majority of people, I think, still today will say no. But of course we have. Craig Ventner and the Ventner, Ventner Institute has done this over a decade ago. And, and of course, even, I guess, about two weeks ago now, we have a proto-embryo, not from starting from a sperm and an egg, but rather from a stem cell. So this idea of what's possible and uh, impossible, and yes, our role in the universe, of course, we have to mention generative artificial intelligence. Any one of these trends, any one of these trends, could change the way that we answer those questions those three questions. And in combination, I would guess that none of us would venture how it can change the way that we answer those questions in synergy. So in other words, great transformations come when we have a new perspective and that new level of awareness that Albert Einstein talked about. 30 years ago would be a reasonable question. Can we make our products and processes sustainable? The answer to that has been, it's been asked and answered. The answer is we can because we have. Now the question is, will we? Will we do it at scale? Will we do it with the urgency that's necessary in order to, to meet these? And to do that, it's going to take brilliant science and technology, but it's also going to take much more. The periodic table of the elements is something we all know, but there are many aspects, many elements that are going to be required. And those are going to go far beyond just science and technology. The metaphorical periodic table of these elements not only includes the science and technology to get to these humanitarian goals of sustainable food, water, shelter, but it's also going to need these enabling system conditions. Everything from economic investment, new research programs, new metrics, new ways of teaching, chemical footprint, uh, new metrics in order to meet these noble goals of zero waste and life compatible products and processes. This is what chemists and engineers do. This is what everybody should do because we're going to need all of these aspects to get where we want to go. It's been an honor. Thank you.